This morning, my sermon is entitled, A Love That Has Permission to Bite. A Love That Has Permission to Bite. You know, when I speak to people about church, especially in recent times, the real struggle that people have with church is, you know, church people are very judgmental. Church people tend to be very invasive and judgmental. Somebody doesn't know you at all, and they may observe something about you and immediately paint a picture about who you are, and, and sometimes that picture tends to be very negative, especially if people are using the Word of God as a means by which they try to get to know you. You know, sometimes we forget that we are not God. <laughs> You know, unfortunately, we have this complex where because the Word of God is filled with so many commandments about the way we should be, we become the Bible police with other people. Not so much with ourselves, but with other people. Why? Because it's always easier to look outward and to point fingers as opposed to looking inward and to ask the hard questions about who we are. And what we struggle with. You know, even as a young person, this was always my issue with the church. Why is it that I should subject myself to the judgment of people who've never really even taken the time to get to know me? And even though, you know, throughout the years I've found that people have the best of intentions, it still is hard. It still is very difficult to find that balance between understanding and loving as Christ loves us, but also being able to hold accountable those who I call my brothers and sisters. And the church has done generally a very bad job at that. Very, very bad job. You know, when it comes to negative criticism, especially when it comes to negative criticism within the church of Jesus Christ, There have to be certain things in place for it to be effective and for it to be something that is productive and helpful. And I think that's where we go wrong as a church. Not just our church, but most churches. We love to talk about what it is that God's will is for our lives, but we're not very good at building community in the way that God intended And so when it comes to critiquing and saying anything negative, it always comes across as as insensitive and cruel and rude because we did not take the time to do as Jesus said, to love each other as he loves us. Everything in the Bible is interconnected. The commands of God are connected to the relationships that we build with God and with one another. The commands actually mean nothing if we don't have relationship. Can you imagine somebody walking up to you, you've never met them before, and they walk up to you and they say, you know, I don't like your hair. (laughs) Or I wish you had hair, like in my case. I don't like your hair. What would you say to that person? Well, please don't say it in church. (laughs) But most of us know what we would say. Like, mind your business. Like, you don't know me. You don't know what it is that's going on in my life. What makes you think that you have any kind of right to speak to me about my life? I mean, if we would do that with someone on the street... We act a little bit more polite about it here in church, but it's the same reality when someone comes up to you and wants to talk to you about your life, but never was invested in your life in the first place. Let me say this. Just because we call ourselves brothers and sisters here in the church of Jesus Christ, that doesn't mean that we don't have a responsibility to care about one another, to get to really know each other to get to understand the intricacies of why we make the decisions we make, why we dress the way we do, why we talk the way we do, what our background is. See, that's the foundation for why God gave us this gift of relationship with him and with each other. It is so that we might be active 
in trying to understand how to love one another the right way. See, that was, that's what should differentiate us from the world. You see, the world builds relationships based on what is going to be beneficial and helpful to me. We build relationships based on the fact that God loves us first. And so now we must love each other in the way that he loves us. But don't think that that happens instantaneously. It takes effort. It takes work. I can tell you this. Not everyone can come up to me and tell me what I need to change in my life. You have to at least... In my heart and in my mind, I think you have to at least have proven to me that you care before you can say anything about what I should or should not do. And that's what I want to focus on today. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to the book of John, John chapter 13, verse 31 to 35. I just want to read a few, um, a few verses here and just comment on them a little bit. John chapter 13. It says in verse 31, when he had gone out, Jesus said, now is the son of man glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you, you will seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Let's pause right there. You know, we tend to skip over these passages of Scripture, not understanding that within them, is the formula for everything else in the Bible. Most people, when you read the scriptures, you immediately think the commands of God. You think of the Ten Commandments, you think of the things you should do and the things that you shouldn't do. And many people, because that's their only concept of the Bible, they don't like the idea of Christianity because Christianity is all about rules and regulations to them. But guess what? The rules and regulations within the scripture only make sense if you understand this. If you understand that love is the cement that holds us together in order for us to understand what the commands are for. If you don't understand the love of Jesus Christ in your life, the commands are only going to look like instructions that are going to keep you from being happy. But if you understand the love of God, if you understand the love that he has granted to you through his son, then the commands begin to make sense. Oh, God is not just trying to keep me from life. God is trying to do what people who have loved me my whole life have tried to do. They try to protect me from destroying myself, from hurting myself. They try to keep me from making decisions that I'm going to regret. They're trying to keep me from doing things that in the long run I may have to pay a hard price for. See, love is that which makes us understand the commands. And Jesus, from beginning, from the beginning of his ministry to the end of his ministry, and here he is, he is close to the end. He's about to ascend into heaven. And he says, I have one command for you. Forget all the stuff about Sabbath days and do not kill, do not steal. It's all about this command. Love one another as I have loved you. And you think... Yeah, that sounds nice. That's, that sounds great. That sounds ideal. But it's more than just an ideal. It is the foundation upon which community is built within the church of Jesus Christ. You know, many churches will say, you know, we have our membership class or we have baptism so that we can add you to our roster so that you can become a part and parcel of this ministry and you can vote in meetings. You know what most churches need? We need love classes. <laughs> we need love classes. We need to teach how to love God and how to love 
one another. You say, well, pastor, who doesn't know how to love? Love means being sweet. Love means being kind. Love means not yelling at people. And above all things in church, love means smiling. <laughs> you got to smile because that's love, right? Oh my goodness, how many times have I come to church angry, angry, and just smiled because, hey, that's a loving thing to do. <laughs> and that's a shame. Where in my heart I'm struggling, but because of church and the way that we judge one another, I put on this smile, which literally means nothing. Love goes deeper than a smile, brothers and sisters. Love goes to us understanding God and the way that God treats us. And I just want to focus on three things that teach us a little bit about how to love each other. Jesus said specifically there, love one another as I have loved you. So no matter what your definition of love is, in order for us to understand what Jesus is talking about here, we have to go back and look at Jesus' life. How did Jesus demonstrate love? And are we doing what Jesus did? Well, there are three specific ways in which Jesus demonstrated love. And I want us to look at them. The first is found in Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. It says there that, the fir that first and foremost, well, let me read it for you here. It is a repeat of a, of a prophecy that was given concerning Jesus. It says there, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. The first way in which God demonstrates his love to us, and the first way in which we should learn love, is by this reality. Love comes to you. Love comes to you. So, Pastor, okay, we know Jesus came to us. He, he came from heaven to earth to show the way. We know the song. But this is very important to understand because love, generally speaking in society, it tends to be based on what we can gain for ourselves. So if you see somebody that's beautiful, oh man, I, wanna, I want a relationship with that person because I love the way they look. Or you see somebody who is rich or someone who has particular kinds, a particular kind of personality and we think to ourselves, there's something about that person that it attracts me to them and I want that. That's the way it used to be. But if you want to understand love the way that God intends, you have to understand love as God coming to us, coming to a situation where he would not benefit. He left perfection to come to per imperfection. He left glory and honor to come to a place where people would not acknowledge him as the God of all gods. He left splendor and came to poverty. He left all of what God represents in the universe and limited himself to a body so that he could demonstrate something to us. God's love is not about what you can get. God's love is about what you intend to give. And that's why most churches struggle. Because when we think about love, we're only thinking about what can we get. We're not thinking about what we give. And that's why we need love classes. Because you actually have to relearn what love is all about. I don't come to you and care for you because you're like me. Or there's something about you that, you can, that I want for myself. No, I love you because God loves me in spite of who I am. And I in turn need to love you in the same way. It's about what I can give you. It's about what God has placed in me to be a blessing to you. That's what love, the foundation of love is about giving, not receiving. The world takes, Christians give. 
That is how we know and understand that we are in Christ. Because it's not about us. It's about God and others. You see, love, the foundation of love is coming to someone else. Not because there's something that they need to give you, but because God has placed something in you to give to them. You know, one of the most wonderful things I've found when I'm down, when I'm feeling depressed, when I'm feeling low, is to just get a text or a phone call or someone just simply saying, hey, you know, I was thinking about you. How are you doing? There, for a pastor, you know, because we're used to doing that, for a pastor receiving that, that's like heaven coming down. It's an amazing thing. It feels as though somebody doesn't want you just for what it is that you offer them. Somebody legitimately cares about your soul. Somebody legitimately cares about your feelings and what you're going through. And there is nothing like being in a situation when you're down, receiving that kind of love. Because I can tell you this, there are moments when you as a pastor, you don't necessarily feel the strength and the encouragement to do the things that you know you should do, to care for people in the way you know you're called to do. But love covers that. Love does such a powerful work within you that it can motivate you once again to those very things that God has called you to do. It's a blessing to receive that. It's a blessing to know that when you're down, you're not alone because someone is looking out for you. You see, that's the type of person that I will give permission to critique my life because that person was there before I messed up. And that person cared about me before I made a mistake. That person was interested in my life before there was anything that I did. Before there was anything that I did either right or wrong. That person loved me because they came to me. Can you imagine being in a church or having a relationship with brothers and sisters in Christ where people aren't just interested in taking from you, <laughs> that they're interested wholly and solely in investing in you. That's what the church of Jesus Christ should be. And if you think about it, how far we have fallen away from that ideal. Listen, my friends, Jesus didn't need to come to us. He didn't need to come. He didn't need to make himself uncomfortable. He didn't need to be born in a stable. <laughs> he did not need that. He's the God of all gods, king of all kings. But he did so to teach us what love looks like. Love comes to you. It doesn't wait for you to mess up and then bark at you. It comes to you. Secondly, along with this wonderful reality that God came to us, he walked with us. He walked with us. You ever wonder to yourself, why didn't Jesus just come and when he, when he became mature, why didn't he just go to the cross? Why did he choose 12 disciples? Why did he walk all around Galilee, all the rural areas and in Judea, preaching the gospel and listening to people critique him and try to kill him and all of this stuff? Why did he go through all of that? He could have skipped that. But he did that again to teach us what love does. He doesn't just come to you. He walks with you. And this is a wonderful thing about God's love. Because when you start walking with someone, that's when you get to know them. When you get to, you can come to church and we, we, you know, we do the smile. We say, hey, how are you? Everything fine? Oh, what a godly person. And keep it moving, not knowing that that person may be struggling in every area of their life. But you wouldn't know, none of us would know, unless we literally spoke to them outside the four walls of this building. <laughs> Sometimes you never know what someone is going through until you start walking with them. Where it's not just, hey, how you doing? And just keep it walking. Have you ever talked to people like that? They say, hey, how are you? And they just keep walking. 
Like, you really didn't ask me that. <laughs> you really don't want to know, do you? But, you know, that's, that's formality. That's just human communication where we just spit out words that really don't mean anything. And unfortunately, we do that in the church of Jesus Christ too. Unfortunately. True love is not about these little ideas of love. True love is, hey, listen, how are you really doing? What's really going on? How is your prayer life? How are you doing in terms of relationships with the opposite sex? How are you doing with work? How are you doing with your family or your children? You see, that kind of love is an investment of time. That kind of love isn't a pass by, hi, how are you doing? That's a sit down, let's talk kind of love. And Jesus did that all the time. You know what I'm amazed with when it comes to Jesus? Jesus knows the hearts of men. So he knows what's going on in your life. You don't have to tell him. But he still would ask. And he still would care. And in spite of the fact that sometimes they would mess up, he still would walk with them regardless of that. You know how many times I read the stories in the gospel about Jesus and how he, he did a miracle and the disciples are still wondering whether they should believe in him. I'm like, Jesus, if Jesus was like me, Jesus would be like, seriously? Like, you guys still don't believe after all the things that you've seen? Seriously? I'd be like, y'all don't deserve me. I'm going on somebody else. But Jesus was patient with people even though he knew their hearts and understood their doubts and understood all the things that were keeping them from having full faith in him. He still walked with them anyway. He didn't judge them. He didn't put them away. He took the time. He took the time. When was the last time you as a Christian really walked with your brother and sister through something? I'm not talking about just the prayer requests that are offered here every Sunday. I'm talking about knowing that somebody's struggling and calling them during the week and say, hey, what's going on? Is there anything I can do for you? Hey, you wanna meet up for coffee? Hey, you wanna go somewhere and just pray together? Hey, you wanna just sit down and talk about some of the stresses, some of the issues? This, my friend, is love. Love is intentional. And love doesn't just come and go. Love stays and walks with the one whom is being loved. And all of us get failing marks for this, myself included. You know, we allow the issues of life or work schedule or home schedule. We, we allow all of the priorities of our personal life to keep us from really loving one another the way that God intends us to. And then we wonder why it is hard for us to have these hard talks with one another. The truth is, we haven't spent enough time building up love and trust in our relationships where we can really talk to each other as brother and sister. You know, when I go home to Jamaica and my, brothers, my brother and my, my three sisters are there, whenever I walk into the house and they're there, I guarantee they're probably going to be like, hey, you know, they're, they're not going to give me like the big greeting or whatever, you know. It'd be like, hey, what's up? You're back. Oh, that's great. That's wonderful. And I'll, I'll you know, but if, let me tell you something. If there's anything on me, if I have a jacket on that's messy or, or anything like that, they're going to be the first ones to walk over and fix my collar, brush something off of me, look in my face, you know, put that thing and just wipe something off. That's what... That's what family does. <laughs> and they don't do that because they hate me. They might be annoyed doing it, but they do it because they want to make sure that their brother's okay. They want to make sure that, you know, whereas everybody's going to smile in my face and shake my hand, they want to make sure I'm fine. They want to make sure that I am doing okay, and that takes effort, that takes observation, that takes time, and that takes care to do that. And we built up that kind of trust because we've been brothers and sisters all my life, but 
You know, we as spiritual brothers and sisters need to do the same. We need to know each other enough and spend enough time together that we're always looking out. I need to be able to look at Bella and I know, I see Bella, you know, Bella's always smiling and then I walk into church one Sunday morning and I look at Bella and I'll be like, you know, something is, something is off with Bella. Something might not be good. And go over to Bella and say, hey, Bella, you cool? You good? And most of the time, Bella will be like, how do you know something wasn't right with me? I'm like, I just know you. I know you because we spend time. We spend enough time. I care enough as my sister. I care enough for Bella that I am willing to know her cues and know what's really going on in her life. You see, that will give me permission to talk to Bella in a way that I couldn't talk to Bella before. Because now I am invested. I come to her, but I also walk with her. And that makes a difference in terms of what I can say or cannot say to her. Thirdly and finally, one of the wonderful things I notice about Jesus' love is that Jesus was able to encourage and rebuke in the same breath. You see, when you come to somebody and you walk with them on a regular basis, you kind of get licensed to be a different kind of way with them than you are with other people. You get licensed to do that. There are things that my mother can do that nobody in this room can do. <laughs> my mother can grab me like this and pull me into that room and I will willingly walk with her. Because <laughs> if I don't, it's going to be a problem. And I'm okay with that because she's my mom. I don't know if I would do that with, uh, with, with anybody else here. <laughs> I might be like, well, where are we going? <laughs> you know? But that's it. She has license because she's, she's come to me. She knows me. She's walked with me. She can do that. But you know, you can't do that if you don't have a special relationship. A turn over to Matthew chapter 16, one of the stories. I won't read it in detail, but I'm sure you know it. Jesus says to his disciples, you know, everybody is saying these things about me. Some people are saying this, some people are saying that. And he says to his disciples, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And of course, the loudmouth Peter, he gets up and he says, I know who you are. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus looks at Peter and says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my spirit. And he says, blessed are you. And he gives him a blessing. So he encourages Peter for saying that which was true, that Jesus Christ is more than a prophet. Jesus Christ is the son of God. But literally, not even a paragraph later, Jesus begins to teach his disciples, look, I'm going to go and I'm going to die on the cross for your sins. And Peter again speaks up and says, no, never. There is no way you're going to die over my dead body. You're not going to die. And what does Jesus say to Peter? Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. That's a big jump from blessing him just a few moments before. But that's what you can do when you have the permission of love in someone's life. You can both encourage and rebuke. Why? Because now you have permission because you have been loving that person. You know, the struggle that people have with Christians is, Christians like to judge and tell people what they're not doing right. When they don't know, they don't spend time building relationship. You see it happening in the nation right now, where unfortunately, Christianity is tied in to a political ideology that makes it look very hypocritical. We talk about loving people, and then in the same breath, the political ideology hates people all the time. 
Then we talk about caring for the sick and for those who are refugees and the strangers and at the same time we mistreat them because of the political thing. And so Christianity has a black eye simply because Christians aren't doing what they profess. But they have a lot of judgment to throw out to everyone. And let me say this, my friend. There is nothing wrong with the command of God. There is nothing wrong with caring about that which is right and that which is wrong. But you don't have license in the lives of people to judge them when you didn't care about them in the first place. It looks bad. It is a bad reflection on God. Because God allows the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. But Christians who say we follow God, we only want the rain to fall on the people we think are just. And that's wrong. That's wrong. Because Jesus didn't love like that. What makes us think that we should love like that? Jesus, Jesus loved everyone, whether you were doing that which was right or that which was wrong. But guess what? Jesus had the license to tell people, hey, you're messing up. Not because he was just Messiah, but because he built relationship with people. He loved them before they messed up. So he had license to bite. <laughs> A license that you earn when you love someone. The problem is we don't earn it, but yet still we want to judge. The problem is we say we care, but we only appear when it's time to castigate and throw negative criticisms at people for what they're not doing. And fundamentally, that is not Christian. You have to build up a relationship with people so that you have permission to both encourage them and to tell them, hey, you're messing up. I don't know about you, but if you have a good relationship with me, then you have license to talk to me in a way that other people can't. You have license to talk to me about my struggles in a way no one else can. But if you don't have a relationship with me, it doesn't matter whether you're the pastor or anyone else. You can't talk to me. I won't receive it because I don't believe that you care. I don't believe you care. Jesus says a new commandment, love God and love one another as I have loved you. And if you're going to love each other the way that I loved you, then you need to come to one another. You need to walk with each other. And as you walk with each other in love, then you can encourage and rebuke each other in the same breath. Why? Because whether it's an encouragement or a rebuke, it's going to be received in the spirit of love. And that's going to, that's going to, build, it's going to build up the church of Jesus Christ and not destroy it. I know people right now who will never darken the door of a church ever again because somebody hurt them. Somebody said something to them that was out of place at the wrong time. And you know what? Church people will judge those people and say, hey, they need to get over it. No, no, no. Would you? Would I? If you wouldn't and I wouldn't, why do we judge people and tell them that they need to get over it? No. It's wrong. But you see, we have an opportunity through understanding the love of God in the way that Jesus intended, we have an opportunity to change that kind of church culture, to move it away from this shouting from a distance, what you're not doing, to standing in front of someone, walking with them through life, understanding their struggles and loving them in spite of those things and giving to them not just encouragement when they need it, but rebuke when they need it as well. When you know somebody loves you, you will receive what it is they give you because you know it's coming from a place to protect you and to keep you safe. And that's a beautiful way for us to live. That's the way families should live. Sometimes it's hard love. Sometimes you got to tell a family member, hey, listen, you're messing up. 
but I'm going to walk with you until you get this straight and you're going to be okay. There's nothing more powerful than seeing a family work like that. And my prayer is not just in this church, but in all churches, by the will of God, we will understand this and that we will stop being hypocritical people, shouting from a distance negative things and, and talking about what people are not doing, and that we will be like Jesus and walk with people, get to know people, understand them, so that we might have permission to bite if that's what's necessary. Amen? Amen? Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this word. Thank you for your truth. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus. And thank you, Jesus, for putting up with us. You know, Lord, you have so many more reasons to abandon us, but you said in your word that you would never leave us nor forsake us. And we thank you for that. Help us not to leave and to forsake our brothers and sisters whether they're doing well or whether they're struggling, help us always to stay with them, to come to them, to walk with them, and help us when the time comes to encourage or to rebuke in a spirit of love, to speak the truth in love so that it is understood that we're not judging, so it is understood that we're only trying to protect the people that we love. Help us to understand this and to apply this in the right way. Thank you, Lord God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.